Good afternoon and welcome to New America. Thank you all for coming to our session today, Leaders, Myth and Reality. My name is Melissa Salekferk and I am a policy analyst with New America's International Security Program. For those of you new to New America, we are a think and action tank, a civic platform that connects a research institute, technology lab, solutions network, media hub and public forum. The International Security Program aims to provide evidence-based analysis of some of the toughest security challenges facing American policymakers and the public. Our research has addressed homegrown American terrorism, the United States drone wars abroad, and the proliferation of drones around the world, and the profound changes in warfare wrought by new technology and societal changes. I'd like to introduce you to our two panelists today, Jeffrey Eggers and Tresha Mobile. Jeff Eggers is the executive director of the McChrystal Group Leadership, where he leads research and advises private and public sector clients on leadership behavior and organizational performance. With Stan McChrystal, he recently co-authored the book, Leaders, Myth, and Reality. And Jeff is also an executive leadership coach, a senior fellow at New America, researching the behavioral and cognitive science of decision making, and an advisor to the Geneva-based Center for Humanitarian Dialogue where he assists with international conflict mediation efforts. In government, Jeff served as a special assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and worked as the White House in 2006 and 2007, and again from 2010 through early 2015. In 2014, President Obama presented Jeff with a Samuel Nelson Drew Award for distinguished contribution in pursuit of global peace and his role in mediating a solution to the political crisis following the 2014 presidential elections in Afghanistan. Jeff retired from the Navy in 2013, serving over 20 years as a combat veteran Navy SEAL. Jeff served in the military as Special Assistant to Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Branch Chief for Combating Terrorism on the Joint Staff, and White House Fellow and Director for Combating Terrorism at the National Security Council. Jeff's operational tours included several SEAL teams, commander of the Special Operations Task Unit in Western Iraq, an operations officer and mission commander for the U.S. Navy's Undersea Special Operations Command. Jeff currently serves on the board of a nonprofit that cares for and assists the families of veterans killed in action. Jeff is also a member of the Nation Swell Council, a forum for advancing innovative solutions to America's most pressing challenges. He holds an MA from Oxford University and a BS from the United States Naval Academy. Tresha Mobile is the producer of the 2018 Emmy-nominated CNN film, Legion of Brothers. The film is about the US Special Forces who were the first on the ground in Afghanistan after 9-11, and it premiered at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival. Mobile produced and directed her first military documentary in 2000, based on the book Blind Man's Bluff by Chris Drew and Sherry Sontag. For this two-hour film, Mobile interviewed U.S. submariners and their Russian counterparts about spying on each other under the oceans during the Cold War. In the decade and a half following 9-11, Mobile produced multiple documentaries in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. In Iraq, Mobile documented in 2003 as the U.S. efforts to install a democratic government gave way to an insurgency for a film called After Saddam. And in 2004, she documented as a team of US attorneys helped Iraqis build a legal case against Saddam Hussein for a film called The Case Against Saddam. In 2005, she produced and directed Saddam's Reign of Terror for National Geographic. In Afghanistan in 2007 for CNN, Mobile produced Narco State, in which she showed how poppy farmers were joining the ranks of the Taliban because US promises for replacement crops had failed. In Talibanistan, Mobile documented for National Geographic the resurgence of the Taliban. And in Pakistan, she embedded with the Pakistani military in the tribal areas which straddle Afghanistan on the front lines of their war against the Taliban. Talibanistan was nominated for an Emmy in 2011. In 2014, Mobile produced and directed a film for National Geographic, American War Generals. The film tells the story of the top generals who led America's wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they had joined the army as America's war in Vietnam was winding down and they had vowed never to make the mistakes their generals had made in Vietnam. Nonetheless, these post 9-11 generals found themselves and their army bogged down again in Vietnam-like insurgencies in both Iraq and Afghanistan. <laughs> 
So this afternoon, we will begin with an introduction to Jeff's new book, Leaders, Myth, and Reality, which will be followed by an exciting discussion between Jeff and Tresha. And then we'll save the last 30 minutes or so for audience questions, and books will be for sale after the event. And please consider joining our social media conversation with hashtag Leaders, Myth, Reality. And with that said, we'll begin with Jeff. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome and uh, thanks for coming today uh, to those in the room and those out in the webcast. Um, let me start by first thanking uh, New America, but in particular Anne-Marie Slaughter and Peter Bergen, um, not only for their mentorship of me personally, but for their leadership of, of this great uh, institution and all it does here. Uh, I've been honored and privileged to be a fellow for the most part, that has involved me writing a book for the last two years. Um, when I walked in this morning, the gentleman downstairs stopped me and almost asked for my ID because um, he just doesn't recognize me because I've been squirreled away writing a book. Um, but it's great to be back and it's great to be part of this group and I um, couldn't be here without their support. Um, Important time to be discussing leadership. When we set out on this project two years ago, we honestly didn't know that this book would land with this relevance um, at this point in time. Uh, I say that both in a specific way that we're, um, yeah, a week out from midterms. Um, so there's a particular relevance, I think, uh, in terms of political leadership and what people are experiencing and thinking about on that front. But just broadly, where are we on the leadership spectrum? Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, just run you through some of, um, not the book's conclusions, but really some of where the book came from in the first instance. Why did we set out on this project and where did it come from? And um, then we can get into some of the conclusions um, when we get into the, the Q&A and the discussion. Um, the, the title of this is The Mythology of Leadership in large part because that's what we ended up concluding. So I will give you that snippet of the, the bottom line here is that much of what we believe about leadership is a mythology. In other words, there is a profound disconnect between how we talk about it, how we've been trained, and how we actually experience it. That's not what we set out to write about, but that's where we ended up uh, in the end. So um, let me also thank my two co-authors, uh, obviously the, the headline co-author, uh, Stan, who was my once a uh, former boss, and now is again my current boss, um, and as well Jay Mangone, um, who uh, we brought out of a public sector job up in New York for this book project and was instrumental to getting it uh, across the line. So uh, they can't be with me today. They're actually doing their own uh, version of book talks and so forth uh, today, but uh, very much a team effort across the three. There's a separate story in how you write a book with three co-authors. Um, <laughs> In some ways, uh, that's the more interesting story, uh, but we'll save that for another day. Um, I train leaders and research leadership, and, and in some ways I've been doing this my entire career, but it's now my day job. Uh, the institute that I run is literally in the business of researching leadership principles and behaviors for the 21st century. We believe that we don't have this right and that we could do better. That's why we built this institute. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a couple examples of how we encounter this both in our business practice, but also in our uh, book research, starting with this one. Um, if you've been exposed to any leadership training at all, you'll be very familiar with the idea that humility and leadership is a good thing. We uh, really kind of hold up and honor uh, humility among our leaders. We, we talk about humble leadership. There's an entire genre of leadership theory devoted to this called servant leadership. It's been around for 30-ish uh, years. And you can literally, uh, come to our institute and sit down with our PhDs and they will stack up literature from um, the floor to the ceiling talking about humble leadership and all its virtues and why it's so effective. And I've been talking about this for a number of years and one of the most recurring questions I get is if humble leadership is so great, how do you explain that guy? Um, in large part because there's a striking uh, uh, contradiction here. Probably one of the most high-performing organizations in American corporate history and one of the most uh, uh, confident, uh, almost arrogant leadership styles that people know of in, in uh, CEOs at this level. 
there's a there's a longer story to Steve Jobs, but it's a great example of the fact that, and this is this is a statistical truth, uh, narcissists are overrepresented in senior leader positions. So I mention that just to say, how could it be that humble leadership is so good, and yet we tend to gravitate towards narcissistic uh, leadership styles? And if that is true, what does that suggest about the ways we misunderstand this thing we call leadership? Let me give you another example. This one's a little closer to the book. Uh, it's a little bit of a quiz. Um, so Winston Churchill here was speaking of an American leader, one of the noblest Americans who ever lived. FDR said, we recognize him as one of our greatest American Christians and one of our greatest American gentlemen. Any guesses? I'm sorry? Truman? Billy Graham, OK. Any others? So you, if you, the, neither of those two are correct. Um, if you guessed Ulysses S. Grant, it would be a good guess, because he was uh, an American president, and he won the Civil War. Uh, but you'd be wrong. It was actually the guy at the other table in the foreground in this picture, Robert E. Lee. And what's so interesting about this picture is the guy who lost the war is in the foreground, right? The, 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 the painting is really centered on the guy who lost the war. And in fact, Lee's legacy in leadership, particularly in military circles, where Stan and I and Jay all kind of grew up, so to speak, is much larger than Grant's in many ways. The, the, the reverence and lionization of Lee far outpaced what Grant enjoyed. And yet, Lee lost the war, and he betrayed his country. So if leadership is about achieving results by organizing a group or an organization toward a well-defined goal, and for Lee, that was to win the Civil War, how is it that Lee came out as a quote, unquote, great leader for so long? And it was only recently that, that we started taking down monuments and statues of Lee very recently in relative terms. So this was one of the other questions uh, that we started the book with. And so Robert E. Lee was going to be in the book one way or another from the very beginning. Um, Stan went to Washington Lee High School. He grew up in Robert E. Lee's neighborhood. Uh, and he went to West Point where many buildings, roads, fields are named after Lee. So Lee was going to be in the book. And then we went out and we found 12 other historical leaders that we wanted to profile, all deceased for a very simple reason. They couldn't argue with us after we wrote about them. Um, so being deceased was uh, a prerequisite for making our list. And we organized them by pairs. And we did that because we actually got an original um, idea from, from a colleague to write a book in the model of Plutarch's lives. If that doesn't mean anything to you, you're also forgiven. It didn't mean much to us either at the time. Um, Plutarch is a, today, relatively obscure Greek classicist, but the father of modern biography. He used to be a big deal. He used to be one of the top-selling books in America, Plutarch's Lives, um, second to the Bible, no longer. Uh, but he wrote about Greeks and Romans in pairs, and he used a specific approach where he would profile one, profile the other, and then compare the two. And we decided to take a similar approach. So we put together pairs of leaders in genres. The first genre we came up with was the, gen the geniuses. Um, not your typical leaders, Leonard Bernstein and Albert Einstein in this case. But we felt that, that was as important, it was important to get as broad a spectrum of leaders as possible. That if we were going to really lift up this idea, this very broad idea of leadership in its broadest, most general form, we wanted to go to the very ends of what people typically conceive of as leadership. Second genre were the zealots, Maximilian Robespierre and Abu Musab Zarqawi, uh, the leader of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Um, so to, to explore this idea of zealotry and leadership. Third, the reformers, MLK and his namesake Martin Luther. We had a tough time nailing down um, this pairing. There were, there were literally um, kind of near fistfights over who should make this list, and lots of great people didn't make the cut. Uh, the, the founders was really an important um, topic today because so much of business leadership 
is driven by this idea of entrepreneurialism. And th these were two great iconic uh, century old brand founders, Walt Disney and Coco Chanel, that, that were high on the list just for those reasons alone. But then the more we actually dug into their biographical history, the more we realized that they were just fascinating characters in their own right. Power brokers were Margaret Thatcher and Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed was a corrupt New York politician uh, of Tammany Hall days um, who we wanted to include because we wanted to bring in people who had tarnished or, or kind of um, adverse experiences with leadership. We briefly played with the idea of Adolf Hitler um, and decided there was just too controversial uh, that, that that historical record was too well trodden, too, too familiar, and that Boss Tweed, a lesser known but very corrupt politician, uh, would do better, in part because he was highly effective, despite being uh, intensely corrupt. And then lastly, the heroes. Um, and here we, we again tried to get uh, some diversity, not just in gender, but in culture and in, in, uh, in its era. The, the gentleman on the bottom right is probably the least familiar to you on this, this list. Um, most of these are recognizable, if not uh, by their image, by their name. But the gentleman on the bottom right is the, the Chinese Admiral Zhang He, um, who's a big deal in China, uh, not so much in the United States, but uh, was, a, was a, um, a leader worthy of uh, inclusion, given what he did in terms of uh, his expeditionary exploits um, in China. And then lastly, Harriet Tubman, for her uh, leadership really as a symbol um, of the, the abolition movement over and above her operational efforts to, to free slaves in the South. Um, so those were the 13 genre, or six genres, 13 uh, people we profiled. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into any of these in any further depth, but uh, happy to discuss any of those that are particularly interesting to you in the, the Q&A. Let me give you another example that was a little um, closer to home for me. And this is actually how the book opens, is with a uh, vignette of Washington crossing the Delaware. And I won't totally spoil it for you, um, but you'll be familiar with this painting, if, if only because it's one of America's most recognizable paintings. Um, and I have to confess every time I talk about this that while I know a lot about this painting, I know nothing about American history, and I know almost nothing about American art. I only know anything about this one painting. And the only reason I know anything about this painting is because I used to sit on that couch <laughs> right underneath the painting. This is a reproduction of Washington Cross in Delaware. This is the upper West Wing lobby in the White House. I worked there for, for six years under Bush and Obama total. And meetings in the White House don't always run on schedule. That might not surprise you. And so you end up sitting on these couches waiting for meetings that are running over. And on this particular couch, if you're sitting there, you will hear a tour guide come through and talk about all of the stuff in the waiting room, the lobby. And so because I sat on that couch, I got an in-depth education on that one painting that was always hanging above my head. The tour guides would just cycle through, and it was the same spiel every time. Um, so I got a first-rate education on this, this painting. Here it is, Washington Cross in the Delaware. And before I tell you what I learned about the painting, just look at Washington and to yourself, for now, pick the word that comes to mind when you look at Washington. Just one word, and then I'll tell you what's wrong with the painting, because that's what the tour guys would always tell me. They, OK, we'll come back. Hold, hold it. We got one resolve. Um, what the tour guides would say on this particular um, piece in, in the lobby was everything that was factually inaccurate about the painting, which is which is interesting given how uh, prominent it became. Delaware River never had icebergs like that, uh, apparently. Even worse, the flag is apparently wrong for the period. I'm not an expert in the, the course of American flag design, but apparently that's the wrong flag for that particular point in American history. If you know your geography of the Delaware River, the boat's going the wrong way. Um, it's depicted actually going the wrong way. Uh, the most interesting fun fact that I kept hearing was that it wasn't a little 12-foot whaling boat. And they never said what it was. They just said it wasn't a little rowboat like that. And so then later, when I started digging into, well, what, what was it, I came across something that said it was a 60-foot flat-bottom barge. 
And then I did, did some more digging, and I found that more recently, uh, an artist was commissioned to do a more accurate depiction. And sure enough, it depicts a 60-foot flat bottom barge. So this is the, the more accurate depiction of Washington Cross in the Delaware. Um, you can see lots of things are different, which way he's going, uh, the river itself, and so forth. But look at Washington again. Just zero in on Washington again. And what do you notice is different? What's his right hand doing? His left arm's kind of doing that weird thing generals do. Uh, what's his right hand doing? Everybody thinks he's steering. It's actually not a steering wheel. That's the wheel of a cannon, which is why they had this 60-foot flat bottom barge. Is if you're going to war, bring your artillery. Basic rule of warfare. So Washington had a barge so that he could bring his artillery with him. That's a cannon. Why is he grabbing it with his hand? Steady. To steady himself. Thank you. Because that's what real people do in a boat at night at war, right? Real people don't do that. <laughs> Why don't they do that? Because it's ridiculous. But when I asked you to pick a word, be honest, how many of you picked something like ridiculous? Right? What was your word again, sir? Resolve. Resolve. Which is more typical because that's how we think of leaders. And it's very natural. It's very natural that we think of leaders with these exaggerated expectations of what they're capable of. And by the way, leaders want us to think of them like this, right? Because there's something very powerful if you can portray yourself as this capable, in large part because it's what we hope delivers us from the challenges we face and gives us a better future. One of the, the more interesting things of, about humans as a, as a species of animals is our cognitive wiring gives us a unique ability to think about the future in ways most animals don't. And because we can imagine the future, we typically imagine it as better. And who else to help us with that but people that are this good, right? But that's a myth. None of us is actually this good, and nobody actually leads their army like this. Um, so Washington Cross in the Delaware is the first vignette in the book. Um, these problems uh, abound. Uh, this is a survey that comes out from PwC every January. It's one of the best surveys of CEO attitudes you can uh, come across. And, and we look at it just because CEOs are, are a good metric of how leaders are thinking about uh, their organizations and their business. This particular question is a question about how do CEOs perceive risk and threat in their environment. And in 2018, the top rated risks and threats CEOs perceive are cyber threats, overregulation, terrorism, um, geopolitical uncertainty. The first thing I usually point out is that we continue to see uncertainty as a risk rather than the reality, which is common, but it's, it's, it's a flaw. But what's more interesting is what they never put on the list. And I've been looking at this list for five years running now. And it hasn't been on the list in five years. What's, what's missing from this list? Themselves. Right. They never put their own leadership as a strategic risk. And they should. Because <laughs> if you go back and you catalog corporate risk events, a lot of them are self-inflicted problems with leadership or employee conduct. So we tend to think of leadership in highly distorted terms. Um, when it's going well, it's us. When things are going bad, it's the environment. This is um, one depiction of how I've come to speak about leadership. It's about where the science of medicine was when we were still doing lobotomies on people. I think that's about where our understanding of leadership is today. Um, just to give you another more popular reflection of this, this is a screenshot of a Google search of the word leadership, just sorted by images. And to me, this is a reflection of how we think of leadership. And it's not a very good reflection. This is my favorite, if only because it looks like my six-year-old son going to kindergarten. Um, but I don't think it's an accurate, accurate portrayal of how we should be thinking about leadership. Across the, the course of our research, we had the opportunity to interview lots of um, very you know, knowledgeable people about leadership. One of the first questions was always, how do you define leadership? It's, a very, it's not a simple question. There's, there's actually a lot of disagreement about this. But 
But the general consensus was something along these lines, that leadership starts with the leader, it's a process, and it's driven towards some well-defined result. You're trying to achieve something, usually through a system of followers, right? Le leadership doesn't make much sense in a, in a context of, of, of one person, right? Um, and so this is how we came to depict the general notion of how people think about leadership if you just ask them, what, what does leadership mean to you? The other thing we had an opportunity to do is talk to some very prominent leaders about their experience with leadership, to include interviews with both um, Presidents Bush and Obama, which was an extraordinary opportunity. Literally, after eight years as president, to ask, how has your perception of leadership changed, and how do you think about it now? And I'll give you a vignette, uh, just in the interest of time, from one of the two, and this one's from President Obama, in part because I was with him uh, when this episode happened on his staff, and that was um, the raid on bin Laden. And about a week after the raid, I traveled with him down to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, when he went down to meet with the team that did the raid. And he did an award ceremony, and then he had a debrief of the operation, and then we flew home that night. And I won't go into uh, you know, the, the details of that, but on the flight home that night, I asked him, really trying to make small talk and just kind of um, chit-chat a bit, what were your reflections on the day? What struck you? And his answers were interesting. None of them spoke about the operational dynamic. And in fact, one of his first answers was nobody then talked about who shot who, which is striking in hindsight now because so many books have been written and so forth. Um, but one of the other things that was, was really interesting was that he focused on the team leader's leadership style. And in, in particular, what he said was, I was struck by the way the team leader did his debrief. And what he meant was, was the team leader, when the floor was kind of handed over and it was his turn to, to basically give the debrief, all he did was say, Mr. President, my team will now debrief you. And that was it. And you can imagine why that's striking, because who does that? <laughs> who doesn't own that accomplishment at least for 30 seconds or longer because you don't get an opportunity like that but once in a lifetime, if, if that. And that's why it was so striking, is because it was, was an example of what we started with, humble leadership or servant leadership. And leaders who lead like that we know are, as we've already said, rare, but they're very effective. Um, they're effective because they celebrate the success of others, they put their team first, always. But if you catch up with that team leader, which I have done now, and you ask him, why did you lead like that? Why did you pick that as your leadership style? He doesn't say, oh, I read a book, or I took a course, or anything like that. What he says is, what choice did I have? How else do you lead a team like that? And I like that example because that, along with countless others, started to point us towards the reality of leadership, which is that it's often not in the leader, despite that that's how we think about it. Leadership is actually driven as much by the followers or the context, the surrounding context, as it is a choice the leader makes. And in this particular example, that leadership style was not selected by the leader, really, so much as it was selected by the system of followers. Because that system of followers demanded a certain style of leadership that was particular to them. And a different system of followers would have probably something different um, that they would demand. So, and this is, this is kind of getting to the, the punchline of the book, this way we typically define leadership, we ended up calling a myth. Right? That how we think of leadership or how we define leadership is basically wrong. And that we need to redefine leadership, um, not just now but always, as something that's more a system. Right? It's not a process driven by a leader. It's a property of a system. And that system includes leaders but also followers and context. And that it is driven as much by the followers as in the context as it is by the leader. And this is one of the fundamental conclusions of our book. We're not in the business um, 
of theorizing about leadership so much as practicing it. So very often we get asked, well, what does this mean when you're trying to do leadership, you know, if you're an actual leader with an actual organization? And one of the ways we've, we've come to speak of this is um, to stop doing this. We, in the 20th century, the, the, the metaphor for leadership could be analogous to being a grand chess master. You see the board, you know how the game's played, you, you, you have a strategy, you anticipate your opponent's move, and you control the pieces, right? And a lot of us were raised with that idea of leadership. This is how we like to think about it, gardening. Because gardeners don't make plants grow, plants grow all by themselves. What the gardener, gardener does is cultivate that ecosystem so that they provide a place where plants can grow. So the, 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 the bottom line idea here is, one, you can't make leadership prescriptive because it's contextual. But to the extent you're looking for a way to improve leadership, the first idea is to stop thinking of it as a process directed by the leader and start thinking of it as a system that the leader is a part of. So with that, we'll stop. Um, I will thank you again for, for being here, but mostly I will thank Tresha uh, for agreeing to moderate uh, and ask her to join me on stage here and we'll have a discussion and then look forward to your Q&A. Thank you. Thank you again for Thank you for being here having and doing me. This. Yeah. Uh, what, what a magnificent book. I've read it and um, I hope uh, it sparks a national conversation about leadership. I do too. We, we, we very much um, see that as one of the things that, that is now um, a great opportunity given where we sit. And given that the book is so broad and so general in thinking about kind of this, this institution of leadership and that many of us are, frankly, whether it's in our, you know, our corporate lives, our organizational, professional lives, our political observations, a bit frustrated with leadership, that we actually hope it does elevate something of a, of a conversation. And all you have to do is turn on the news, and everything is about leadership, right? What are the metrics? Because if, if I watch Fox, I, I leave thinking Trump is a great leader. He's mobilized people. They feel very happy. He's very effective, and he's not very humble. But if I turn on CNN, I feel like the world is about to end. So how, how what would be the metrics, and what would you say about um, the tone of today's leadership? Well, to, is it to, inspiring? Is yeah. it? Okay, okay. Um, Sorry, there's we a unpack, lot there. Yeah, we got to unpack that a little bit. So on the first question about the metrics, it is the, the holy grail of leadership studies. It really is. Um, the, the brightest minds in leadership studies are, you know, all thinking about what is a real viable metric of leadership? How do you measure it? And what do we mean by effective? And how do we know who's going to be effective as a leader or when and why, more importantly, a leadership a leader is effective. Um, and in some ways, that's why we think it's important to start with the definition, because your metric is going to come from how you define it. And in some ways, that's, that's the point of the Lee example, is if you define leadership effectiveness as what a leader achieves or whether they achieve what they set out to achieve, we call many leaders great or effective who were, were well short of the mark, like Lee. So, whether or not a leader achieves something really isn't a good metric. Um, in many ways, and in, in given the way we've defined leadership, we think of leadership as the ability to motivate, you use the word inspire, and you do that by giving a group a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, a sense of identity. And when, we, when we're really honest with ourselves about the the history of quote unquote effective leaders, leaders who have been held up by history as being great or notable or sometimes popular, it isn't because they achieved something so much as they made us feel a certain way about ourselves. They gave us a sense of identity. They gave us a sense of meaning. And for good reason, it's a very powerful force in leadership because it's very primal and it's very useful, universal. All of us is walking around with that thing in us that wants to find that sense of purpose, that sense of identity. Political leadership's no different. And 
you know, the, the, the real challenge is we talk about both um, a leader's values, but we also talk about the issues, right? And when we talk about the issues, we're talking about what we want done, what we want a leader to do. We want them to raise taxes or lower taxes. Um, and, and, you know, there's all sorts of leaders who say one thing and then do another. Um, and a lot of the debate is focused on the metric of the issues and what the leader is going to do. I'm for this or I'm against that. Um, I think a better metric is to get to the values. And what metric that is will be different in political leadership for every single one of us because it's going to be a reflection of what we decide we want in a leader. And it won't be issue-based because we actually don't know what the issue of tomorrow will be. We can say it's taxes, but it, it may be China or it may be the Middle East. We, we don't know what's around the corner. So the better hedge is to base the metric on values because that's got a better shelf life, really. And, and it's a better judge of how that leader will behave, even if we don't know what the issue is that they will be deciding on. And that's both very individual, very personal, and then as a collective, we can come together and have a discussion. Before we look at the leader or turn on the TV, we can just come together and have a discussion. What do we want in a leader? Can we come to agreement on who we are and therefore what we would want in a leader and make that the metric? And then go out and start watching TV and thinking about the leaders. Does the civilian world grow good leaders? I think, I think you can say it's obvious that the military does. But, but do we do this in the civilian world? Well, your point that it's obvious that the military does is an interesting one. Because the military, I was um, at Gallup yesterday, and Gallup's been doing polling on how Americans perceive credible institutions. And there's been a collapse in trust or perceived credibility of institutions across the American uh, population, with one exception. A couple, but mostly the military. Firefighters are still pretty high. Bankers are all-time low. Congress. But is, the military focuses on it as a point of education. Right. You have to right. constantly well, train to be a leader, right? Right. And, and, and for that reason and other reasons that are just more fundamental, you know, the military is often or occasionally asked to go put themselves in, in harm's way in service of this country. For a lot of good reasons, we hold the military up on the pedestal. My point was only that it doesn't, because someone comes from the military, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a good leader. The three of us wrote an, an editorial in the Wall Street Journal a few weekends ago on this question of whether or not you should instinctively vote for a veteran. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, we come down saying, a veteran has certain advantages in the realm of leadership. But again, vote for a veteran, if you will, as you would anybody else, right? That it's it's not the breed, it's the person, and look mm -hmm. at the values or whatever you're going to look at in that person and don't instinctively go to a veteran as a leader. Sorry, there was a little bit of a Just wondering, if somebody picks up the book, are they going to get a sense of how I become a great leader if I just read this book? Well, the book yeah. actually says it can't work that way. Mm -hmm. And we, books that do that sell very well. But there like, are traits in these leaders that you can glean. Right, but they won't transfer. That you, because you find a leader and you study them to death and you say, this leader had these seven things, these five things. Um, and then you say, okay, therefore, and oh, let's do this across, let's do this longitudinally across 20 or 80 or 100 leaders. Let's crunch the numbers and we'll say, ah, I'm going to write a book on the seven secrets or whatever of leadership. Um, you will be proven wrong. Uh, Jim Collins' is Good to Great was that kind of a book. And if you go back and you look at Jim Collins's organizations, they were great then. Not all of them are so great now. Um, same problem with leadership. If you, if you find the leader who has really, whether it's Steve Jobs at Apple, um, who failed at Apple the first time and didn't do so well at Pixar in between, um, and you, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to do this, but you were to lift up a leader like Steve Jobs that's high performing in this one place and time, 
and you say, oh, this is a great CEO, we want to turn around this company, and you drop them in over here. Because it's a different company, it's a different context, they may not do as well, particularly if they're going to rely on what made them successful over here. Um, and you see, all this, you see this in professional sports, winning coaches that have a great record here, and they get transferred and can't replicate the formula of success. So it's the context, the charisma, the followers, the leader, everybody like one big family. It has to be operating. a systems approach, and that's yeah. the problem with it, is that's not appealing. Mm. If you agree that that's the reality, it's not appealing to us because we like this to be simple and formulaic. One, because it's important, right? Leadership, none of this diminishes the importance of leadership. And because it's so important, and because we have trouble keeping track of complex systems-based things, just because we're human, we want it to be simple, distilled, and formulaic. And that's why if I write a book that says, these are the five things that make for a great leader, it will sell really well, because that's what people want. But we're not convinced that that approach will work. And so to answer your question, if there's one thing a leader can do to be better as a leader, to flip that around, it is to start to pay attention to the system and start to learn to modulate your approach as a leader based off the contextual realities of the system. And that's something you can do. That's a real skill. So it's not to say that leadership can't be taught. It's not to say leadership can't be learned. But it is to say we need to rethink how we teach and learn and practice leadership. Do you have a favorite character in the book? <laughs> I, I do. It's, um, I, this is one where the co-authors definitely disagree, um, which is a good thing. I, I was very partial to Albert Einstein, which is tough because who thinks of Albert Einstein as a leader? I mean, you think of him as a physicist, a genius, but if you think of a, a, a leader, particularly a thought leader, as being someone who fundamentally changes the way we think, and has an impact on our lives. Albert Einstein is a leader by those measures. Because he, he, one, he revolutionized the field of physics in many ways. But two, he, he made a practical difference in our lives. Whether it's the GPS all of us are carrying around on our phones, which is dependent upon much of his uh, achievements or, or anything else. Um, he, he really did have a big dent on a lot of our lives. And he did it in this very non-traditional way. He was literally the leader of almost nothing his whole life. Um, in fact, when he was offered the presidency of Israel, he turned it down famously because he said, I'm not qualified for that. I think he just didn't want the job because he, he liked being a thinker, not a manager. So he, in some ways, he defines the stereotype of a leader because he never led anything. He didn't really lead a big organization. He never managed a huge group of people. And yet he still had this influence over this huge swath of us somehow. And so to think about where that influence came from and what it means for leadership with him and then his, his um, counterpart, Leonard Bernstein, to me was very interesting. And why is it that geniuses are so influential or captivating to us? Do great leaders get a free pass, or do we want them to be moral, and do we, do we bring baggage in terms of our expectations of them? The, I mean, they definitely don't get a free pass. They, they get a lot of scrutiny, um, which is one reason people self-select from leadership, is because they don't look forward to the scrutiny, particularly in this day and age, or the digital environment, where the scrutiny and the intensity of the scrutiny has just gone way up. Um, but in some ways, they do get a free pass because we will look past leaders, some leaders, with some indiscretion for, for a variety of reasons. And you know, the history of, of leadership is, is famous for this. Um, and you, you, know, you can encounter all these um, leaders who actually had really good behavior, but really bad decisions and really bad results like Lee. Because Lee was, it's hard to find instances in Lee's personal behavior, demeanor, disposition that wasn't anything short of impeccable. Which is partly why he had such an amazing legacy. As Stan likes to say, if he were in this room, all of us would find him to be the most 
like impression, you know, uh, uh, forming person in the room. Like all of us would be struck by his demeanor. But at the same time, his, you know, what he fought for and his record of results, and frankly, how he made decisions. The most important decision he made of his life was whether to accept Lincoln's offer to fight for the Union or whether to stay with Virginia and fight for the Army of Northern Virginia. And he actually didn't make that decision. He said, before Virginia decided which way it was going to go, he said, I will go whichever way Virginia goes. So he actually he deferred the decision. And in, 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 in some ways, we say leadership is all about making decisions. Well, Lee never made the most important decision of his life. But history has been so kind to him. Right, right. And, and in part, I think that's because of a historical explanation, yeah. the lost cause narrative and the reconciliation process after the war. That's a huge factor that's very particular to Lee's legacy. But you know, uh, beyond that, the fact that he had this, um, this kind of sterling reputation just because of the way he held himself and the way people looked at him even physically. And that's one of the things that's really bewildering about how we perceive leaders is that physical appearances matter. And Lee, and Lee benefited from that, I think. Did good leaders, how do they make a difference just in day-to-day -day life? I mean, I, you know, we, I yeah. live here in D.C. and I, I sometimes think like I wish the roads were nicer, the schools, right. you know, it's 2018, the schools are horrible. I mean, why is leadership so important? Well, you, I think you touch on part of it. I think good leadership has to affect the day-to-day -day lives of the people in that system. And that should be part of the deal. And in fact, that in, in kind of modern Western leadership, that is the deal. Because all of us, particularly in political leadership, give up small amounts of, of either personal liberties or a certain amount of our wealth in the form of taxes so that our leaders can do something with that, do some good. And the, the quid pro quo is that the, the potholes will go away, mm -hmm. right? And if the potholes don't go away, we say, ah, oh, bad leader, throw them out. Get a new one who will promise to fill in the potholes and give them a chance to fill in the potholes. So I think at one level there is this quid pro quo, particularly in politics, of the day-to-day -day lives of that system get better in whatever way that becomes aggregated and, and so forth. But at another level, particularly outside of politics, it's not about our day-to-day -day lives and the potholes. It's really about, and you mentioned it earlier as, as a form of inspiration, but it's about whether each one of us feels like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. Whether there is something in us that is awakened, either in terms of what we're a part of or why we are here, that feels bigger than us. And really effective leaders don't just fill in the potholes. They get, lead, they get their followers to, to feel one of those emotions, right? And it is an emotional thing. They do it in various ways, not all of them good, frankly. Um, but that's, I think, a better and a higher level definition of what we should expect and what they do. Is there, is, is there a difference between leaders in government and leaders trying to make a profit in a business? Do you need different traits, or is it? There, there is, of course, um, mostly in um, you know, the, the, the constellation of stakeholders. So in fact, you can, start to, you can start to categorize it much further than that between privately held companies, publicly traded companies, um, non-governmental organizations, public sector organizations, and so forth. Um, I think that one of the, the critical differences between private and public is much simpler. Um, many of the leadership ideas, I think, hold and transfer. The one that's very different is whether you're operating off of a budget or whether you're operating off a profit. Right? And that's, that's actually tough for private sector leaders because while they're shareholders in a publicly traded example, demand profit, most of us aren't motivated by how profitable our organizations are. We are to some extent, like because that's where our bonus comes from or that's where our compensation comes from. Or, but, but a lot of the research suggests that 
while that stuff's important to us, it doesn't actually move mountains inside of us. Hmm. And where public sector has, has an advantage is the fact that it's public service. And if you tap into a sense of service, like you have in a lot of, of, of government work, um, and, and, and non-government work as well, but um, like the work that's done here, you're tapping into something that's more fundamental than profit. Um, and that's, that's a key difference. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, either nonprofit or public sector organizations struggle because they are operating off of a smaller budget and, and people aren't compensated as well and so forth. But what they have going for them that they can really leverage to their advantage is this sense of service that's kind of always in the background somewhere. What do you think is the most important takeaway of the book, or what, what do you hope that people yeah. take from this? Um, fair question. <laughs> um, some ways we should either start or end there. Uh, you know, the, the, the most important idea in the book um, is that we've misunderstood leadership in terms of what it is in the first instance, as I, as I, as I covered in the slides that our typical definition or way of thinking about leadership is misguided and, and based off of a myth. Um, and that it may be appealing to think of leadership in this, this kind of um, uh, inaccurate way, but it's, it's misguided in that it leads to a lot of frustration. And a lot of the frustration that we feel today is because we've bought into this inaccurate notion of what leadership is in the first instance. And that part of the solution of being less frustrated and being more successful with the quote unquote practice of leadership is to reframe it as something that is about a system and to create space in that system for the rest of the system, i.e. the followers, the context, everything other than the leader themselves. Excellent. Shall we open it up for questions? So if, if you would, um, we'll just uh, wait for the mic so that everybody here will hear each other, but so that the folks out on the webcast can hear you as well. Um, yes, ma'am, please. Uh, my name is Jenna Russo. I'm a research associate at the Public International Law and Policy Group. Um, I was wondering, in your discussion of leadership, whether you considered um, like the way that men and women have been socialized to understand leadership, um, and specifically in you know changing thinking towards more systems thinking. Um, uh, personally, I feel like women have been more. Um, introduced to that idea earlier on in, in their personal education. So I was just, um, yeah, curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. It's an incredibly important question. And, and we, we actually do touch upon that in the book, um, not just in our thinking about the canon of leadership being a patriarchal one, which it is. And our 13 leaders reflects that. I mean, it reflects the fact that the historical record of leadership um, is, is imbalanced in that way. But more importantly, in a forward-looking way, we talk about the fact that one of the very interesting findings in leadership studies is that companies or organizations with a better, less gender inequity, and i.e. a better gender balance, are higher performing, just period. Is now, that because women are more humble? Well, that's the, that's the million dollar question, is why is that true? No, it, it's, it's, a fairly, it's fairly well established that that is the case. So the, big, the, the more interesting debate and where it's less clear is why is that the case? What's the causal explanation for that? The, the most humorous slash cynical explanation I've heard for that is the bar for women is higher, so women have to be better to get to the same point. Therefore, organizations with more female leaders are going to be do better because the, the bar is just higher, right? That's a very like direct, uh, straightforward explanation. More of the explanations or theories go to your point about the ways in which women, and I'm not going to speculate on, on why 
women would lead differently, but that the way in which women have been either conditioned or taught or disposed to lead does lend itself to thinking more about the system, whether it's having, um, you know, the, the, the term that's frequently used is a sense of emotional intelligence, i.e. being sensitive to the needs of the system, needs of the followers, and whether that's something that conveys and manifests in that result where you get um, higher performance. So there, and that's just the beginning of the discussion because how the two genders approach leadership uh, is a different in a whole bunch of different ways before you actually get to the leaders themselves. Before, before you get to that, you have to talk about how does the rest of the system think about them? And you know, one of the classic examples there is that there are different standards and that what systems of followers expect and tolerate among male leaders is different than, broadly speaking, than it is for female leaders. I, and I'm not making a, a judgment on that. I'm just making a, a statement of, of an observation or I would say fact. Um, and if that's a reality, then what does that say about either how men or women should lead differently? You know, what does it say about which way you would, you know, approach it from either side? And then it gets into much, you know, more complex issues like how, how do uh, male-dominated industries do with female leaders and, and vice versa and so forth. Um, there's a million questions within just the gender aspect of leadership alone that, that would make for lifetimes of study and are well worth that effort because it's, it's, you know, it's important to all of us. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Adi Zafar. I'm uh, working with the United Nations Development Program. Uh, I liked the system approach that you said where the followers and the context is as important as the leaders drive. Uh, but I come from Pakistan and, uh, well, if you start following uh, what the followers want and the, what the context requires, you will end up having populist leaders who will probably, in that part of the world, it's not too good to follow what the followers want and the context requires requires from you. Most of the unpopular leaders in our country are people who uh, do not follow uh, people's demands. So I just wanted to know if, if it's uh, universal, this approach, or uh, it's for the more evolved societies and culture. Yeah, fair question. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make a huge distinction between, um, you know, the, the political leadership implications for Pakistan versus a Western democracy. Um, I mean, Imran Khan was just elected in Pakistan and hardly a career politician. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Imran Khan is, a uh, professional cricket celebrity now. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's the Michael Jordan of cricket in Pakistan. and. You know, that's very telling, right? That we can elect, or Pakistanis can elect, um, a professional athlete, um, or in the American context, a Hollywood movie star, Ronald Reagan, as an elected official is a very interesting statement about leadership. Um, and the Pakistanis aren't nearly as subject to kind of the, the populist sentiment that's going through um, Europe and the U.S. right now, and it's not just in the U.S., it's, it's pretty widespread, Brexit in the U.K. and so forth. Um, so populism is, uh, yes, a form of thinking about giving more weight to the followers, um, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, and one could argue that, that the populism engine is being driven as much by the leaders as it is by the followers, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a feedback loop there. And it's incumbent on both sides of that loop, I think, to step out of it and say, let's not define this about what we are not, what we are against, but let's define this in terms of what we are for or what we want for ourselves or how we define ourselves. 
And you know, it's, it is you know, important for both sides to do that. But if it's driven from the leader down, then you're much more vulnerable to the, the misguided notions of one single individual, right? That, that system is much more vulnerable to, to imperfection when it comes down from the leader than it is if it's a system approach, because that's going to be more resilient, because now you're, you're allowing for the fact that there can be a reverse form of accountability, where the followers will hold that leader accountable. Um, so it's a fair point that a system-based approach can, can run ahead of itself in an in a adverse populist way, which isn't always good. Um, but I don't know that it has to be that way. And frankly, there's a lot of that that's, that's almost um, inherent in politics, because politics is as much a deselective system as it is a selective system. In other words, we, we run against the status quo in hopes for something better that will replace it. And it's, hard, it's really hard to get out of that cycle when it starts running ahead of itself, because that's how, in a system that becomes hugely populous, that's how people win is they compete against the other side and then it just gets into a, a bad back and forth. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, Nizar Farsakh, I'm a leadership trainer myself, uh, was at the Kennedy School. Great. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by, your, um, by your talk and there are two themes I'm interested in your thoughts on. One is leadership, of course, in service of others, but as enabling the others in dealing with uncertainty. Because definitely if, if, if we're certain, then that's management, that's not leadership. Leadership is required when there is uncertainty. So how much of what you've seen has been in the context, that is, that the leader was a leader because they helped the group get better at dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. The second prong, or the, the second theme, is uh, distinguishing uh, authority from leadership. That is, people could be in a position of authority uh, but that doesn't necessarily make them leaders. And sometimes the best leadership comes from people who are outside of their authority and they take on a, a, an active leadership role as an activity. So if you could speak to both of these right. themes. Thank you. Um, both great questions. Obviously, coming from someone who trains leadership at the Kennedy School, I would, I would expect as much. Um, the, and let me just take the second one first. Um, you know, having influence without authority is... Um, as you suggested, um, is quite powerful. Um, in many ways, it's, it's more inspirational. Harriet Tubman, when she started rescuing slaves in the South, had no authority. Right? And yet she made our list of leaders. Um, and to the extent she ever gained any real authority, it was because she had done enough of these kind of audacious slave rescues that she became a symbolic leader of the abolition movement, which was looking for something that it could hold up as a symbol of that movement and galvanize, motivate, unify that movement. So a lot of, of um, influence without authority comes from appealing to those non-authoritative forms of influence, like being a symbol for something. And the best way to become a symbol for something is through your personal example and personal behavior particularly if it's really far outlying and exceptional, like the case of a short African-American former slave by herself going south, risking enslavement to rescue first her relatives and then um, slaves. So you, know, you, you can have a lot of influence without authority just by capturing people's imagination through your personal example, i.e. becoming a symbol of something. Um, how you transcend from personal example to being a symbol of something is a, is a longer conversation. But it does generally involve some degree of exceptional behavior, either in terms of its consistency or its magnitude, right? For Lee, it was consistency. Like, he never wavered from that impeccable demeanor. He got nicknamed the Marble Man at West Point because everybody joked around that he was like a statue. He just was impeccable. Um, and it was, for him, it was the consistency that made him a personal example uh, for, for others to try and emulate. Remind me the first part of the question. I'm, I'm so dealing with uncertainty. That's oh, right, uncertainty. Yep. Yep. 
So one of, the, one of the, the truths that we find in leadership, which I find most fascinating and is very practical, even though it's um, complicated, is that effective leadership manifests in paradoxes. And the answer to the first discussion we had about the juxtaposition of humility versus confidence is to take both of them. And that truly effective leaders know how to be both humble and confident. Your question about uncertainty falls into the same paradox model, which is that really effective leaders can both be quite certain about the vision for their organization and quite open to where that organization is going to go. And that sounds like a contradiction or a paradox. It sounds like I said two things that were in contradiction. But that's a, precisely what a good leader does, is they are crystal clear about where that North Star is, but that they are very open to the idea that how you get there or even maybe the need to change course is going to be subject to where that organization needs to go. So there's a lot of, I think, um, particularly in this day and age where competitiveness is more about your ability to face uncertain environments than it is about, about crystal clear and, and prescriptive about what we need to do and where we need to go. Um, and so in some ways it's about having that clear vision but then kind of keeping your hands off the system and letting the system respond to the dynamics of, of how it senses where that organization needs to go. And getting those both in balance and right is, is a tough needle to thread, but critical to being an effective leader. Um, Holly in the back, right behind you. Hi, my name's Holly Fussell. Um, my question is about nature versus nurture in terms of charisma and whether or not that you tackle that in the book and the features of the different personalities and whether you think those leaders had innate, innate traits that got them to opportunities that developed further opportunities and drew more people or whether um, that charisma can be cultivated um, out of le less raw natural resources in a given person? Yeah, great question. And the, the book does go into that. Um, the, the, the really um, kind of uh, generic version of that question is the born versus made debate. And in some ways, that's supposed to be settled. Uh, you know, if you go back through all of the, the twists and turns of leadership theory, it was more the case that we believe leaders were born and then about World War II era, mid 20th century, we shifted to saying, no, 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 leaders are made. And in some ways, it swung back to be about in the middle. Um, and the reason it swung back to being in the middle is there's an indisputable dimension of leadership emergence, and I won't say effectiveness. And I, and I say emergence because most of the research on this can't really talk about whether leaders are effective, because that's highly subjective and difficult to measure, to go to your metrics question. It's more about whether leaders emerge. And in the studies of leader, which is much easier to measure, um, this, in the studies of leader emergence, one of the things that's most striking is how a lot of the principal factors are innate. Um, and, and something that most of us can't do much about. Number one predictor of whether someone's going to emerge as a leader, we've already covered it, gender. Number two predictor of whether someone will emerge as a leader? This is harder to guess. Introvert or extrovert? Nope. Height. Oh. Yeah. So um, why is it that people of, but, but um, you're, you're, what you're, about being an introvert or an extrovert? We've always heard that. You're right. And, and loosely associated in a lot of people's minds with quote unquote charisma. And all of us know the answer to this question, because if I asked you to go find someone with charisma, you'd all be able to do it. And then if I said, put your finger on what makes them charismatic, you'd be like. And then if further I said, go be charismatic like that person. Um, so there is something that, that, that we don't understand about why we're drawn to certain people. And it goes beyond height, of course. To your question about introversion versus extroversion, um, in some sense, we, we touched upon that when we said narcissists are overrepresented in senior leader positions. Extroverts do better in terms of leader emergence. Introverts tend to 
have higher performing organizations, but they're less well represented. The, the answer for the first part of that's obvious. Extroverts promote themselves. They stand up and say, give me the job. I'll take the promotion. You should promote me. Introverts don't do that as much. So extroverts tend to rise up and emerge as leaders for some ways direct reasons related to them being extroverts or narcissists. But then once you compare not leader emergence but leader effectiveness, you actually find that introverts um, and to some extent organizations with more uh, female leadership do better because they're less authoritarian and they're better able to listen and process the needs of their system and their organization. Um, that's one of the explanations among many. So it's a bit split on extroverts versus introverts. But lots of great introverts are super high achieving in this regard, but they have a harder time getting there, I guess. Great question, Holly. Yes, sir. Right here. Hi, thank you very I thank you very much, uh, Ian Free with the Close Up Foundation. Uh, you mentioned earlier that when you were doing your own talk that you were considering Hitler as one of the leaders and Zarqawi's up there and there are other people who you definitely, we would consider to be doing the wrong thing or leading in the wrong direction or maybe even evil, uh, but can't deny that, there be, that they are leaders. So I'm sort of interested in when you look at leaders who obviously no one themselves thinks of themselves as evil, but when you think of leaders that are leading people in a zealot cause or down a dark path, what is similar to other leaders they have and is there anything different about them? Yeah. Um, in some ways, that's a difficult question to judge except in hindsight. Right? And if you think about the, um, you know, the examples that we tend to work with, their, their legacy has changed over time, right? Um, I mean, when we were in the thick of it, a lot of Americans wanted to make peace with Hitler. They did not want to go to war with Hitler. And the political momentum in this country was actually what those who thought we should fight Hitler would negatively call appeasement. And there's a, there's a you know, a complicated explanation, World War I and the reasons we got into World War I and fatigue with that and so forth. Um, but it took, you know, some course of history before Hitler became who Hitler is today. One, because we got the facts and the dust settled and we could see more clearly. Um, but two, attitudes, attitudes changed. Um, and if you go back, to, if you take today's notion of who Hitler is and how effective or ineffective Hitler was as a leader, even though we're all agreed about how good or bad he was, right, which is more of a moral judgment, we would have an interesting debate about whether he was effective or not. Because he did galvanize his country and then achieve some, some military progress after that galvanization. Clearly marks of effectiveness in the way we typically define leadership. And, you know, we could have a more interesting debate about whether he was effective because he was pathological. And by the way, many very effective senior leaders, if we could give them a clinical diagnosis, which is hard, um, many of them would show up as pathological. In fact, there's a great study that suggests many former uh, uh, heads of state in the West have tendencies that are more outlying rather than more moderate and central. So there's a correlation between effectiveness and emergence and, and that as well. Um, but really, your question's about the moral judgment. And that's why I think, you know, and, and Tresh and I were discussing this a bit before we started. We can say effective leader, but that's not the same thing as good leader or even popular leader. Um, Boss Tweed, who was corrupt as hell, Right, a bad leader. He was immoral. He stole from the city a lot of money. He was finally arrested, thrown in jail, because the New York Times ran this big expose on his corruption, because somebody ratted him out, one of his political enemies. Long story, but he went to jail. 
right before there was an election pending, he won that election. Because he was so popular with his base, and he had so much momentum in that popular support, they kind of they looked past it, right? And so there's all these cases kind of with, with examples that are much milder than Hitler's, right? Where we have a very skewed view of leader effectiveness versus leader morality. And we will side with leaders in our own interest and look past indiscretions. Um, more common than I think we think we do. And it takes a long time for generally for everybody who was involved to be dead, plus about another 20 or 30 years before we have good perspective on that. And we can have an honest conversation about whether that was a good leader or not. This is one of the most difficult questions we're dealing with. Um, you know, why leaders that we think are morally borderline can have popular support, whether it's, you know, in whatever context you want to approach that is a very, very difficult but fascinating question. And that's probably an unsatisfying answer, but that's probably the best I can do given how difficult it is. Yeah, thanks for your question. Okay, time for maybe one more? One more. Okay. And, then, and hopefully you can leave us on a happy note about leadership. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks a lot for this very broad discussion about leadership. Uh, my name is Dennis Willey. I'm an active duty Army colonel and a military fellow here at New America this year. Uh, my question and comments are about the systemic or systems approach you took and that you effectively have elevated followers to be co-equal in the system. Yep. Uh, and, and I'd like for your thoughts, whether you had them or not, previous to publishing and writing, or if you have them now, about the topic focusing on leaders and propagating this myth of leaders are more important than followers, even though the, the pr approach you take is that they're now co-equal, and whether or not you should see some future study about studying followers and characterizing followers in ways that help us understand the overall approach. Yeah, no, it's, um, I, there's a bit of irony because the institute um, that I run has a number of, we have trainers, facilitators, uh, PhDs and academics and so forth. Several of our people are very interested in this question of followership. And there's books been written about it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an active question. Um, and in many ways, it's the, it's the question that emerges or is begged by the model. Um, to go back a little bit, we, we say co-equal deliberately, right? It, it's actually a good start for leaders to think of themselves at the bottom and put followers at the top. That's what servant leadership says, right? Is that the leader's job is to serve and enable the followers, and the followers are really the ones who, who make great things happen. That's servant leadership. The reason we did kind of a, a melding and put it as co-equal is because the thing servant leadership gets wrong is that we are drawn to models of heroic leadership, and that confident leaders, there is a place for confident leaders, or even directed leaders, but not always, right? And so we wanted to create a model that would be more in sync with the reality that servant leadership is a great aspiration, but none of us actually shows up that way. To take the Washington Cross and the Delaware example, like there's something in us that really does want our leaders to be good and not put them at the bottom, but sometimes we want them to be at the top, um, but sometimes we want them to be at the bottom. And since we can't really make it one or the other, we, we tried to create a model that allows for that to be in balance. Um, you know, the, the, the great thing about this idea of followership, which is probably not a great term because it denotes something I think is isn't helpful, is that it gives every single one of us agency, which is extraordinary when you think about it, right? That each one of us is a miracle waiting to happen, really. Well, that's our happy note. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's something for all of us to celebrate, whether the, it's the leader who gets it and goes, wow, I can move mountains with that, or whether it's us who just goes, man, what am I going to do with that today? Um, recognizing individual level agency is a great place to start and maybe a great place to end. <laughs> Thank you for your question. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. And um, let me thank Tresha uh, again and all of you for coming. And if you would uh, like, I'd be happy to stick around and sign books if any of you have one or buy one. Thank you again.